Hello, I'm Vicky Warren and today is University Mental Health Day and this year it's all about using your voice. So we asked our students to get in touch with their questions via social media and we're going to put them to Claire Dickens who is the university's um, senior lecturer in mental health nursing. Hello Claire. Hello. Could, I'm well, thank you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, um, I'm a mental health nurse by professional background, studied here at the university um, and the majority of my career has been spent within um, the clinical um, setting, perhaps at the, the more acute end, but I was really fortunate in 2014 to be offered a role here as, it's, as the university's first strategic lead for mental health and wellbeing um, and looked at a very different context around mental health um, at the response end of things, but also with, with a view of preventative uh, measures and, and well-being principles and it's it's gone from one thing to another we've had real um, opportunity to be innovative think differently um, think much further upstream um, and had a little bit more freedom to consider how we do things in a much more sustainable way and that's what led us to develop the strategy around three minutes to save a life which is a collaboration between um, connecting with people and for mental health that was developed by Dr Alice Cole King um, who's a a clinician, a consultant psychiatrist, who developed a training strategy around suicide and self-harm awareness that when I first was introduced to the, the, the work, it changed the way I practiced forever. And I really thought at that point, everybody should have this training. We really need to democratize well-being and suicide prevention to make it a community uh, responsibility um, and principle. And that's, that's where we went. Um, and we're really fortunate that it's, it's gained the momentum and the success that it has. Great. And today there's been an announcement by the Education Secretary, <coughs> um, Damien Hines, about a new task force to support students in making that transition to university. So I'd like to start by asking you about some of the challenges and pressures that face students today. I think... <laughs> If I start off potentially with a bit more of a critical gaze to consider that we need to be mindful that we can't pop students into boxes and assume that they will all experience the same stresses um, dependent on, on, on where they're, you know, how they're coming into higher education. And that's what I really hope of this task force with government, that they have people sat around the table who've got the voices of, of, of our students from our kind of university sat around the table to say, well, this is what our students experience by and large. A lot of our students are mature, have caring responsibilities, so that the principle of the transition from home to university and moving out, that, that doesn't apply to them, a lot of our students, and it's, it's commendable that they, you know, they will drop their kids off to school and then come into university and be here for nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. That's stressful in and of itself, particularly if the transport links aren't there and parking. So it, it, it's, it's a different kind of stress, but stress nonetheless. We need to be mindful not to box um, students and their individual stresses into um, a principle of considering that all students experience exactly the same things. I think if I, if I want to go down the route of trying to categorise what I've observed, um, and I don't think it's changed that much perhaps from when we were at university, um, there's a lot about us that is actually the same similar stresses and I find a principle of, of belonging or not feeling that you belong in this particular um, context and Deborah Curitan um, who works here at the university she's done a lot of work on that principle of, of exploring student belonging along the vein of, of well-being and I think that's there's something in that a lot of students who are struggling don't feel like they're quite fit mm -hmm. in this particular context um, for, for whatever reason and I suppose that leads me to consider then that as a species um, although we're designed to connect there's a lot of social comparison that goes on um, so very often students when they get their results will be asking each other how they've got on and then there's a comparative thing going on and always there will be better and lesser people than us and that can drive our distress so I think that social comparison element um, does come into it in terms of transitions I suppose we can't ignore the social pressures that any student may experience while they're here at university. And it's not just about the accumulation of debt, because that almost feels like a distant principle. It's actually surviving and thriving while they're here at university and affording to eat and live whilst they're going through their studies. So I think it's the, the acute focus of having enough money just to get from A to B. That obviously has a lot of pressure or adds pressure to students' um, well-being. And then another principle that amazes, well, doesn't amaze, but I find really interesting is this principle of perfectionism. And I think it is slightly different 
compared to perhaps when we were at university. And I, I watched a TED talk from a, a very good colleague of mine, Dominique Thompson, who's a GP in Bristol and is, has a real passion for student mental health, who spoke about a principle of perfectionism that's going on socially and how we're being constructed. Um, and that for, for individuals going through university in particular, can they engage in anything anymore just for the fun of it? Do we have to win at absolutely everything that we do? And, and I'd really encourage any students to consider if you have the opportunity whilst you're here at university, have some time for yourself with a view to engage in something just because you can and because it's fun and not because it's going to contribute towards your CV or it, it's, you've got to win at it and be the best at it. Um, and Dominic Thompson made a really good point that if we think about the impact on our, our mental health, you can't even bake a cake anymore without having to win at, at that. At yeah, baking. yeah, I love yeah. Bake Off. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, that, that may be having an impact in terms of our principle of, of social perfectionism, whereby some individuals set the bar so high for themselves, it will never be possible to achieve what they've set out to do because they've just chucked far too many obstacles in their own way and nor do they have time to celebrate that success. So it's something really um, worth considering in, in, in a university context and, and a bigger social context, I suppose. Yeah, that all right? yeah that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now I'll move to one of the questions that was uh, came into us via Brilliant. social media. Yeah. So um, it <coughs> follows on from what you've just been talking about, actually. What is the best way to fight university stresses and anxiety? I think the word that sticks out for me there is fight. Um, and it's worth considering often when we're feeling overwhelmed, although it's not comfortable, it's our brain working exactly as it should. It's not abnormal. Um, when we feel overwhelmed, there's a physiological response that's occurring. So don't, don't, don't try and recognise it as something wrong or to be avoided. If we consider the principle of happiness, well, we know the value of feeling happy and settled if we'd fe never felt unsettled um, or, or unhappy. So it's about embracing that principle really and instead of trying to fight things how do I build resilience and resourcefulness and it's a, a massive principle of the connecting with people approach in terms of not medicalizing distress um, and, and, and quantifying how we feel into almost diagnostic categories that are to be avoided and an indication that something isn't going well um, how do we build resilience and resourcefulness how can we keep ourselves as well as we possibly can um, and in terms of specific university stresses and anxiety I suppose one of the biggest fears for students that may drive their distress is fear of failure mm. is fear of failure and if I'm speaking honestly I think that university staff have a massive role to play um, in, in ameliorating some of that distress and actually sharing some of their failures yeah, talking about their own how they've gone through past. some life or even in an educational context and I tried it out a couple of weeks ago when I um, released some grades for students and actually shared my own experience of undergrad study where I failed a module I'm over it I'm over it <laughs> I'm, oh, I still remember the day vividly, but what I did with that failure. So you're not just sharing failure, you're sharing strategies through the eloquence of sharing your own experiences of how you overcome that failure because you're demonstrating that you can. Mm. You can. And actually, I reflect, I probably learnt more from that module having to revisit it. Do it again. And, and my academic yeah. style, um, mm -hmm. being able to be, I'm, I'm still not very succinct. I can talk forever. <laughs> Um, but it, it's something that I even have to consciously work on to this day. So learning isn't just a, a box of I've got that and, and it, it, it's a constant commitment. And sometimes you don't recognise that until you're actually told this piece of work at this moment hasn't quite hit what it, hit, hit what it needs to. Um, and we need to go back and revisit it. So I think, yeah, we, we need to consider how academics have a role to play in actually preparing students for not succeeding first time round. Because that was another question actually, do you believe the university lecturers could be more supportive of students with mental health issues? Um, <coughs> so it's obviously you learn from experiences, but it's, it's about mm. how you communicate that sometimes, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I suppose if we consider not going down a two-tiered system of, of university staff, university students and consider that we're all human beings kind of in this together um, and if we look at andragogic principles of education, I learn so much more from our students than what they will ever probably learn from me. Um, 
so we, we're kind of in this together. So what I would advise for that is that actually we all need to look after our own mental health first. And that's not selfish, it's sustainable. Um, and then we can tolerate the distress of others because ours is in check. Um, we, we, we can actually hear and tolerate other people's distress if they come to us with it. I mean, a big focus of Jeff Layer's work and a lot of staff, Phil Gravestock here at the university and beyond, has been about creating an inclusive curriculum, one that considers well-being at the very design stage. Um, a lot of students become overwhelmed because of the type of assessment. Mm -hmm. um, they don't do particularly well in exams, exactly. but could flourish if they did a live voice examination. So it's about kneading some of those principles into the bread of, uh, and considering them longer a well-being vein at the very, very start when we're designing some of these modules and giving students perhaps a, a, a choice. And we need to figure out and navigate how we do that more. Um, and that's what's really exciting. But then again, I've supported many students who've had absolute fear to dread of doing an exam. And then it's just been my responsibility, I suppose, to help that student develop good exam strategy. Um, and then they've overcome that fear of sitting an exam because they did well in that exam. So it's, ca it's catch 22, it's yeah. catch 22. I suppose in terms of the work that we're trying to inform with three minutes and, and connecting with people is that our staff are, are I don't want to even use the word cold face, but they're at the, the cold face of, 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 of student life. Um, and for students who've got a good rapport with their personal tutor, it's probably more likely that they will approach them when they're feeling overwhelmed than they would do the university counsellor or students. But it's another barrier. Um, and there's something in it, isn't there, that when I look you in the eye and say, this is how I'm feeling, it's good to actually equip our staff with the confidence to know that actually they can make a difference in that very moment and potentially tip that person back to a point of feeling more settled. Um, but I take for granted it's a difficult thing to do. And I think that's what the training aims to do, isn't it? It's to give people <coughs> the confidence to, to say something and, yeah. and know how to deal or with it. Or not say anything at all. Mm, just just having, having the confidence to listen with the view to understand. And it's, it's something I always mention in our, for our, to our nursing students as one of the core communication principles um, of, of listening with the view to understand is very different with the view to respond. If you're having a row with your, or your partner, listen with the view to respond, yeah? <laughs> but but if, if you're there therapeutically listening, no, sometimes you don't have to say a word. You just can validate that person's distress by giving them some time just to communicate how they're, they're feeling, um, which can work wonders, can work wonders, yeah. Some good tips there. Um, and this is another question that came in. Mm -hmm. uh, if humans are by their nature social creatures, why do they get social anxiety and I how can well. we I'd combat it? it. <laughs> <laughs> I think stripping it back to principles of compassion based awareness that, you know, as a species, we're probably more alike than we're unalike in how we tick. But then again, there'll never be another me, thank goodness, and there'll never be another you. So it's worth recognising that we're all individual in our, in, in our own right. Um, but then again, what I've come to find in my own experience supporting individuals is that no one will ever judge me any more harshly than I judge myself. Mm. And similarly, I would never judge you as harsh as I judge myself. So I think very often we can assume people view us through the same lens that we judge ourselves. So you walk into a room, if you're self-conscious about your appearance or how you talk, mm. or whatever, you assume other people are viewing you or judging you in exactly the same way, and they're probably not. Mm. They're probably not. Um, or if they are, unless they say something, you don't know and you can't deal with it. So I think we need to be awareness, uh, aware of, of, of the importance of being kind to ourselves and perhaps not judging ourselves as we wouldn't judge anybody else. So I think that drives a lot of social anxiety. There's also a principle that Paul Gilbert talks about in terms of social comparison, um, that human beings can be incredibly tribal. Um, it, our ability to connect is, is one of our saving graces um, because we're quite good when we get our heads together and say we've got a problem, we need to help each other. But it can cause most difference and inequality when we group with individuals who are similar to us, have the same qualities or, or attributes. But we can compare ourselves to each other within those principles and that can drive social anxiety as well. If we look at some of the principles of, of, of what's happening in society, you know, if you have a, a, a better car, a better house, all these things that we place value mm. into, um, and maybe that overlooks the principle that actually kindness is one of the, the, the most important qualities and, and valuable principles that we can offer ourselves and, and other people. But it's difficult, mm. it's difficult. It's difficult. 
and again when you consider how we, we might have evolved as a species I don't think sometimes our brains have managed to catch up with what's going on around us in terms of what makes it tick um, so we're becoming quite isolated so the principle of loneliness that's coming through in research a lot now um, fascinating work but it, it also makes us aware that you can feel incredibly lonely even if you're in a family of 10 um, or you're in a, a university class of 30 you can still feel incredibly isolated and, and lonely because you can't connect mm -hmm. with other people uh, around you and I think some of that might be related to that that comparison principle that Paul Gilbert um, talks about and social media has a role when you you may have millions of followers mm -hmm. but you may still feel very yeah. lo alone and yeah. like you don't know who to turn to with things even though you've on the face of it got lots of friends yeah. and you're loved and you're admired mm -hmm. but it, it, it it's it's a concept mm -hmm. that's admired isn't it and, a, and a, people are aspiring for that kind of life but under the surface and we see that a lot with celebrities who are struggling with their mental health and we assume because they've got fame and fortune but they're, they're more alike with me and you than they are unalike um, so yeah sobering yeah. it is sobering yeah um, and then just moving ahead to sort of mm -hmm. what people can do, what, what is it, what advice would you give to someone who is starting to feel overwhelmed for whatever mm. reason? Yeah. What, what sort of tips or advice would you give to that person? I think I'd, I'd advise any of us to consider, when we look at mental health awareness and mental health education, I think one of my bugbears at the moment when we talk about mental health campaigns, and that's why I love what we're doing here at the university today, we're looking much further upstream and looking at well-being and principles of how we encourage our well-being as opposed to saying this is depression, this is anxiety, this is this, these are all the these medicalized categories of, of distress and looking much further up upstream of how we actually tick. So it's good to, I think what you owe yourself is to consider when I'm feeling overwhelmed, what physiological symptoms do I experience and why am I experiencing them? And you recognize at that point that actually my brain is working exactly as it should. It doesn't feel comfortable. It's not healthy over a long period of time because it will have an impact on our physical health, our ability to sleep, um, regulate our weight. There's nothing ill about your brain at that point when you're feeling overwhelmed, so don't avoid thinking about it. Um, but know that it will pass. So if you experience anxiety, know that it will always pass because physiologically, your brain can't keep your body in that state for too long. And I do not dismiss anyone's experience of anxiety who experiences it regularly. Mm -hmm. um, it can feel incredibly debilitating, incredibly um, lonely um, and physically painful so it's worth recognizing uh, from a psychoeducative point of view why you're potentially feeling overwhelmed that your brain has received some information that it needs to figure out that it needs to get you ready to either fight or, or run away from so it's worth I think telling your brain at that point stop what it is, what is it that my brain is trying to navigate and validate your own um, stresses I do this um, I'll share some of my own tips. I am an infernal worrier. It's what I do. It's not my fault, but it, it, it's how I tick. Um, so I will just write a worry list. Mm. I just will write a worry list and actually figure out what it is that I'm trying to navigate at the minute. Of those worries, if there are any problems, I can recognize that there are potentially solutions and I might have the resource to figure that out myself. Mm -hmm. If there aren't and I haven't got a clue how to navigate this problem, I know then I need to ask for help. And I'd advise any student in this context that actually validate your own um, distress and distress triggers, write them down and figure out what you can figure out yourself mm -hmm. or potentially what you haven't got a clue because you've never navigated this before. No. So it's not to say that you should know. You've never navigated this before. Who do I need to actually ask to help me? Um, and very often your personal tutor can be with that one single point of contact who you could get in touch with and say, I need help with this. Mm -hmm. Do you mind pointing them in the right direction? And hopefully the personal tutor will know. And if they don't, they can make a commitment to figure it out with you. Mm. Um, so I'm a personal tutor now and the, the, there are some things that students bring to me and I haven't got a clue. Right. So it's a learning process for me as well in terms of figuring out, well, where can I get support for this particular 
thing and they did this issue um, and we tend to figure it out yeah. we tend to figure it out and again human beings are quite good at it when we get our heads together so if you started to feel overwhelmed validate that distress in the first instance and I think the best way to do that is actually write it down even that in and of itself is getting the worries from swirling around in here without having any real validity get them onto paper and figure out what they actually are and then come up with some potential solutions or routes for you to ask for help yeah yeah that's a good tip and what should you say if someone tells you that, that, that they are having suicidal thoughts? Um, I think a lot of people worry in that situation about saying the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. So if someone does disclose that they're having a really, really difficult time and they've yeah. thought about ending their life, mm -hmm. what sort of things should you say or can you say? I think it's partly the reason why we um, went along and, 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 and supported the strategy that we did around three minutes to save a life and connecting with people that it's a really difficult thing to hear and have a conversation with somebody about them considering that their life is not worth living um, but there are free training resources available as well online the zero suicide alliance they launched a free training tool and it's very much constructed at a level that's appropriate for you nobody expects you to be a counsellor or a mental health professional or, or an expert in anything but I don't actually know what an expert in suicide prevention actually looks like um, I think we need to strip it back mm -hmm. and deconstruct it so that as another human being actually it's an absolute privilege if somebody looks you in the eye and say this is how I'm feeling because if you think about all the barriers mm -hmm. that person may have had to actually overcome and actually say the words um, fear of being rejected, fear of being judged, all the rest of it. It's absolutely a, a privilege, but what do you do with that? So I think going back to what I advised earlier on, very often when people are considering that their life isn't worth living, um, it's a communication of distress to say help. So if you can try and figure out what that person needs help with. So I would ask somebody, how can I help you? If I can help you in any way, what can I do? If I could make the load lighter just for one issue that you're juggling at the moment, what would that be? So it doesn't feel like then that you're responsible for everything because you're not, you're not. Um, but what can I do in the next five minutes, the next 10 to help this person feel better? And that in and of itself may start to affiliate that person's distress. It's worth highlighting at this point that the university um, have contributed towards a resource developed by connecting with people called stayingsafe.net. Mm -hmm. And that is um, a, a massive principle that we would advocate around safety planning for everybody to pre-consider who they would talk to if they're feeling overwhelmed and what strategies and resources they may actually call upon if they're feeling overwhelmed. It's good to consider before that happens. It's not to say that it will, but I think these thoughts can be set anyone. Um, we just probably don't admit it often enough mm. because there's a stigma attached to it. Um, it's worth noting that often suicidal thoughts are not a symptom of mental illness, they're an indication of distress, physiological and emotional pain that people are struggling to overcome but it's important to know that they will pass. We just need to figure out how to keep ourselves and potentially others safe until they do. Thanks for that Claire. And just going back to the theme of University Mental Health Day, using mm -hmm. your voice, can you give any tips <coughs> to our students about how they can empower themselves and perhaps have a positive impact on the future of student mental health? I mean, I, I love in mental health that for a very long time now we've had um, a, a co-production principle of involving service users, those with living experience of, of experiencing mental health difficulties. But I've always been very mindful that we need to be emotionally intelligent how we actually feed some of that back and how we think about how things are being supported at the moment. So I'd always advise thinking about a traffic like system of, of what's going on at the moment that is actually really good and it's working really, really well. We need to feed that back because hopefully they will do more of that in a university context you know you you support students really really well at the beginning mm. of our, our journey but actually towards the end mm. uh, we feel a little bit isolated so can you do more of what you do there yeah. there make it positive as opposed and constructive as opposed to this is all rubbish because actually it's how human beings are built isn't it if you have nine out of ten experiences that are good and the one that isn't you will hone in on the bad because that's how we're built that's not our fault but we do have a choice to, to be constructive about how we feed that back to say you do this really really well can you do more of that mm -hmm. and this is what we think that maybe you could could start to do mm -hmm. um, so I think even that in and of itself in a professional context and when you go out there into the world of work 
it, it's a really good strategy to have because if you become the individual who's known as, as the, the grumbler, mm. you can lose impact in terms of, think about how you present that because never in the history of being told what to do do human beings like being told what to do. Um, and this university is full of human beings. Mm -hmm. We're all human beings. Um, so we need to think about how we actually present some of our feedback. That would be my biggest advice to students. Um, but know that their voice is, is valid, but it's how it gets, it, it's heard. Um, and if it's done in a constructive way, you've got more chance of actually achieving, in my view, what you want um, out, of, out of that process. Great. Well, thank you, Claire, for your time. For did you enjoy that? I did. <laughs> I learned, I always learn something from you, Claire. <laughs> I always you. take a little nugget thank away. You. <laughs> okay, thank you, Claire. So if you're a student who's feeling overwhelmed um, at the moment with anything related to your university life, it's good to consider who you might reach out to with the view of gaining some support. Um, validate your own distress, get that worry list on the go and figure out what's driving your distress at the moment and know that this will pass. Consider contacting your personal tutor uh, in the vein of any academic related issues that you're experiencing at the moment. There are also module leads and most of our modules have support tutor elements within um, that, that design. So it's good to know who you might call upon um, if you're feeling overwhelmed at the, 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 the commencement of your modules that you're studying um, as well as your course lead. Um, in terms of a wider gaze of, of support and well-being, it's worth considering also your own friends and family. And I know that that's individual to everybody. For some individuals, their family may be the reason why they're feeling overwhelmed. So it's good to consider what's going to be good for you and who you might call upon if you're feeling overwhelmed. But don't ignore friends and family if you feel that you could actually call upon them and that is applicable to yourself. It's also worth considering um, who else exists within the university context and we do have a student support and wellbeing service that you can self-refer to through our student support and wellbeing pages um, that, are, that are available through the university webpage where somebody may contact you at that point then and consider what are you going through, what's happening at the moment and then come up with the appropriate um, care plan, support plan, however you want to call it um, to, to actually support you to go forward. Our students' union, we shouldn't ignore who either, who've been doing some fantastic work for many years now um, that accumulates to, um, if, I, if I separate them off, to advice and support. So students have got somewhere else to go. They have a menu of choice, an option, um, to go to the advice and support service um, to consider what's going on for them at that point. And they can achieve impartial advice that's not related to the university. Um, and they also run a Well at Wolves um, strategy that looks at principles of well-being and giving you opportunities to consider what you might do to actually um, contribute towards your well-being. But you have another vein of support that you might be able to actually access at that point also. So another um, source of support that I want to draw your attention to is StayingSafe.net that was developed by For Mental Health and Connecting with People and which we proudly contributed towards um, including some of our students who shared their experience of developing their own safety plan. And these students would actually not consider that they've ever felt that overwhelmed that there's anything to be that worried about but we really want to adopt principles of safety planning much further upstream, kind of like breakdown cover for your car. It's very difficult to do anything or navigate navigate support systems or services for the first time when you're in the midst of crisis. It's just not easy to do. So it's good to consider much further upstream in terms of, of preparing for if ever you're feeling overwhelmed, who you might call upon. And StayingSafe.net really embraces that principle that if ever you're considering that your life is not worth living, what is it that you can do to distract yourself and get support until those feelings pass and with the view of keeping yourself safe until they do because they absolutely will pass, we just need to consider how we achieve that. Um, so I would signpost you to that resource and I also think it fills that gap at the moment that we're very good at telling students um, to talk about their mental health and talk about their problems and I appreciate that for some individuals they might not have the language, there might be barriers for them to achieve that or they just don't want to. So it's, it fills that gap that you can access this online resource and actually there are videos that walk you through and talk you through how to actually construct your own safety plan.